Namaste. So last night we had a very lively discussion on our private chat, group chat, the Secret Heaven Signal Group. And uh, some very interesting questions came up. And uh, Hunter asked one that was really uh, like out of scope for a, a chat group, but is an excellent question. So I decided to make this video about it. And the question is, like, what is the relationship between bhakti and liberation? Okay, so we're going to go back again to our four views, Chatur Darshanam. The first view is Dvaita Vada, and the yoga for that is Karma Yoga. Then Vishishta Dvaita Vada, the yoga for that is Bhakti. Vivartavada is for Raja Yoga, and Ajatavada is Jnana Yoga. So, today we're going to focus on Vishishta Dvaita Vada. Vishishta Dvaita Vada means conditional non-duality. <laughs> We're in duality now. We perceive the world as duality, but we know that on the higher levels of the path, we go beyond it. And we realize the non-dual, absolute Brahman. So this is the realm of Bhakti Yoga. And the qualification for this level is one must be a Madhyama Adhikari. What does that mean? It means that one is neither a beginner nor <laughs> has reached the top. Uh, Madhyam means in the middle. <laughs> so one has begun the path. One has begun the process of sadhana, but is still in process. Okay, so again, I want to stress that this bhakti yoga is not the conventional bhakti yoga based on rituals, rules, and regulations. That's actually karma yoga. It's described in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu in the introduction by Sanatana Goswami that the Raganuga Bhakti, or uh, advanced stage of spontaneous love, is beyond rules and regulations. It just makes a lot of sense, you know? You cannot force someone to love you, isn't it? If you try, you'll simply drive them away and kill off whatever love was there. And we see this, actually, in the spiritual organizations that claim to be uh, for a bhakti, but actually they're on the level of karma yoga. They try to legislate love. They try to order people to do this and do that, and that's love. No, that's not love. <laughs> that's karma yoga. Bhakti yoga is spontaneous. It springs from the heart naturally because of the beautiful qualities of the beloved. So in other words, the natural object of love is the Supreme or God or Brahman. And because of the beautiful qualities of the Supreme, then we automatically uh, want to love the Supreme. This is real bhakti. Now, our vision or our conception of the Supreme may vary. And between the different levels of bhakti, which we're going to explain in this video, it matures from a very dualistic concept to almost complete non-duality. So now we're going to talk about the inner stages of the Vishishta Dvaita Vada uh, that one develops as one cultivates bhakti. And I want to quote a beautiful Sanskrit verse. Adao shraddha tatasadu sango tabhajana kriya 
tatonata nivriti syat tato nishta ruchis tataha ata saktish tato bhavas tata prema bhyudanchati sadakanam ayam premna pradubhave bhavet kramaha Wonderful verse, huh? In the beginning, one must have a preliminary desire for self-realization. This will bring one to the stage of trying to associate with persons who are spiritually elevated. In the next stage, one becomes initiated by an elevated spiritual master, and under his instruction, the neophyte begins the process of devotional service. By execution of devotional service under the guidance of the spiritual master, one becomes free from all material attachment, attains steadiness in self-realization, and acquires a taste for hearing about the absolute supreme Brahman. This taste leads one further forward to attachment for transcendental consciousness, which is matured in bhava, or the preliminary stage of transcendental love of God. Real love of God is called prema, the highest perfectional stage of life. And this is from the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the ocean of love of God, uh, or actually the ocean of the nectar of love of God. And incidentally, I published an edition of the complete Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu back in, I don't know, 2010 or something. And uh, I'm linking to it in the video description here. So if you want to know everything about Bhakti, download and read these books. Very informative. So that's a long verse. That's a big piece of information. Huh? Let's take a look at it in a diagram form. So here is, on the left side, the six stages of conscious evolution in the form of the six bodies, uh, beginning with Anamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha. You've heard us talk about this before, back when we were discussing the teachings of Ramana Maharshi. I think it's uh, Uladu Narpadu. He discusses these uh, different bodies. So, in the first stages, the Anamaya, Pranamaya, Manamaya, we're still in duality. We're still thinking of ourselves as a body and mind. But in the higher stages, Jnanamaya, Vijnanamaya, and Anandamaya, then we are beyond the body. We're in the stage of pure consciousness. So then, on the right side, the stages of bhakti are uh, given according to the verse that we just read. Shraddha or faith, sadhu sangha, association, bhajana kriya, regulative devotional service. Uh, now this is all on the karma yoga platform. But then comes anarta nivritti, the removal of Offenses. What are offenses? Offenses are thoughts, words, and activities that diminish one's spiritual standing. So it's possible, just like as if you had a bank account, and every day or every week, whenever you get money, you're putting some savings in that bank account. But then one day, you take out a bunch of money and blow it on some nonsense. <laughs> So this is like uh, an offense. In bhakti, we're trying to accumulate impressions of love of God. And the more we can accumulate, then the higher and more tasteful our love becomes. But then if we do something against that, uh, especially offending the spiritual master, offending the devotees like that, uh, then we can lose all of that. And we've seen it happen many times. So be very careful of these offenses. Because when the offenses are completely removed, 
we reach the stage of nishta. Nishta means attachment. Attachment for what? Attachment for this state of love. Because it's so beautiful. It's so pleasurable. It's much better than any mundane pleasure. Because, why? It's long-lasting. See, it doesn't go away. It doesn't dissipate. Uh, only if we, if we make offenses, it might. But once we're free from offenses, it only grows and grows. And that leads to the state of ruchi. Ruchi means taste. So when we get taste for spontaneous love, from that point on, we don't need any support from outside. We become independent. Uh, we will never lose that taste. This is the permanent stage leading to asakti, attachment. Asakti means na asakti, not asakti, asakti. Means that, you know, wild horses couldn't drag me away. <laughs> I'm attached, I love this. <laughs> and no matter what happens, I'm gonna go through it to the end. And that leads to bhava. Now, bhava is something wonderful. Bhava means devotional ecstasy. And this is realized in various ecstatic symptoms. Choking of the voice, tears flowing from the eyes like waves, goosebumps all over the body, feelings of like liquid energy flowing up the spine, oh, it's just amazing. You can't believe it. When it first happens, you wonder if you're going crazy, but it's so wonderful, you don't want it to stop. <laughs> and really what's happening is that the intense love is dissolving the mind. And then finally, prema. Prema is pure love of Godhead, pure love of the absolute, Brahman. And this can be... Uh, with form or qualities, saguna, or nirguna, without qualities or form. So, okay, in the elementary books on the beginning stages of bhakti, prema and moksha, uh, pure love of God and liberation, are seen as different. But in the final stage, prema and moksha are one. Why? Because someone who is in prema has no material desire and hence will not take another body in the next life. So what does this mean? Moksha is attained through meditation and prema is attained through bhakti. But actually, both of these states are identical. <laughs> What's the difference? Well, the attainment of prema is the result of a long, slow, steady process of sadhana that goes on for many years. And actually, in this process, there is no real effort to attain liberation. But liberation comes automatically. Okay? The, the thing is, it comes on God's schedule, not on our schedule. So, because we're attached to being the doer, because we're stuck with the idea of, if I'm going to get liberation, I have to do it. Uh -huh. This, this bhakti, this, this chanting and offering stuff and all of this, this is not going to give me liberation. <laughs> so I have to do something about it. I have to sit down and meditate and all of this. So really what it is, is that the Raja Yogi is too impatient to wait for liberation to come all by itself so he has to do something about it, right? <laughs> but guess what? It's an illusion. 
We cannot get liberation by our own efforts. Why? Because then we would be the doer. If there is a doer, there is an ego, there's an individual, there's a person. So, because to execute Raja Yoga, we have to be a person, we have to be a doer, then we can't get moksha because that is a block. What happens in bhakti is that the ego is gradually worn away, like the stone worn away by the water in the stream. And then liberation comes all by itself when the ego is completely gone. <laughs> so if you're too impatient to wait for God to liber give you liberation <laughs> or goddess, then uh, you want to perform Raja Yoga and go through all that trouble of meditation. <laughs> and it is, it's a big austerity. But then, in the end, the result is the same. The ego becomes worn away and finally disappears and there's your liberation. So, I hope that's clear. Please download these books, The Nectar of Devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and uh, perform your sadhana regularly. Uh, whether you do bhakti, puja, uh, japa, mantra, or meditation, the result is the same. Aum Tatsat. Budu Sarnai. <laughs>